Uh, hello again. This is Maya talking. This is our project. Um, a couple names here and there, but mainly mapping displacement in historical Detroit. And of course, as Lauren said, we were using the case studies of Black Bottom and Paradise Valley to kind of pitch uh, a possibility for um, reparations. So this, the next slide, thank you, Miles, is um, what our paper ended up looking like. It's 44 pages. Uh, we get to the deliverables at the end, but that's the kind of headshot and it's what could reparations look like. And then we jump into it. Uh, the next slide gives you a sense of the contents. And so, you know, we start off kind of looking at the MDOT project, the boulevardization that's coming. Um, then we go through a pretty extensive, well, I mean, it's limited, of course, because of space, but uh, a pretty, um, anyway, historical backdrop of some key um, um, components of this history that created the situation that we're dealing with now. Then we go to the mapping, the conundrum of mapping displacement literally, um, moving on to assessing loss. So a method, a note of method, because that is incredibly difficult in certain cases, impossible, um, but we still did what we could. And then the forward thinking was bringing in prospects and uh, potentials for uh, reparations nonetheless, right? So none, despite the limitations, what is still possible? And then acknowledgements and we close. So moving to the next slide, our agenda today is, yeah, to go through uh, the highlights of each of the sections of our project, which the three of us kind of divided. Um, and so we'll kind of go in turn mapping through what we ended up being able to achieve in our in our final project. And then recommendations, concrete recommendations that we were able to get out of um, oral history interviews that we did with uh, people in Detroit, prominent figures in Detroit, including Lauren, and then um, discursive themes. So the ways in which we think our paper is kind of making interventions into, uh, into specific parts of uh, discourse, as well as future directions. Of course, this was all preliminary. It really only scratched the surface. And so the hope is that as we're doing right now, it will expand and be taken up um, further. So to begin with the historical overview, I think I turn it to Danny here. Yeah, thank you, Maya, for that introduction. Um, I, you know, maybe even before, so I'm going to provide just some historical context that for those of you who have done research on Detroit might be some, you know, stuff you already know. But before that, actually, I'll just say um, we kind of started off hoping to, I guess, sort of try to take a numerical approach. There was a study in, in the Rondo neighborhood of um, Minneapolis, St. Paul area um, that you know, did kind of take a number from, um, you know, the destruction of homes. And what we ended up finding was just that the home ownership rates were you know, so low in um, these neighborhoods that uh, I think there were around 2,000 households in the area that um, was identified for highway re re removal. And there were only 36 that the city directory listed as owner occupied. Um, so I, I guess maybe just wanted to start off with that. Um, so people you know, that might be kind of the initial reaction you want to have to, you know, what we would look at in the reparations project. Um, anyway, just for historical context, um, so 1946, the Detroit plan um, under the administration of Mayor Jeffries is released, and that's what sort of first talks about um, what they call the Gray Street Redevelopment Projects. Um, and, you know, highway construction is obviously a huge part of the post-war um, urban planning sort of vision in Detroit, but it's not necessarily the, the, you know, the only reason why these neighborhoods are targeted. They're close to the downtown area. There's a um, Black Mountain Paradise Valley. There's, there's a um, concern over, you know, the quote unquote slum that's very you know, racialized. There's these um, neighborhoods are conceived in pathological terms that their quote unquote cancers that would spread if not quote unquote eradicated. And um, so it's the highway is sort of one consideration that the city wants land to build a highway um, to the suburbs and that the, you know that's something they're gonna do anyway. So that was part of the justification for the cost of clearance in these neighborhoods. Um, yeah, another key moment, 1949, Albert Cobo is elected as mayor largely based on support from, you know, racist white neighborhood associations that oppose both racial integration and oppose public housing. Um, there was another candidate, the, the Democrat that year, um, George Edwards, who was maybe more open to public housing. That's something that we wanted to sort of think through a little bit to what extent was public, like significant public housing construction really on the table in Detroit, what might that have looked like? Um, you know, even with Jeffries in 46, there's talk of public housing, but, you know, very much 
ambivalence as well um, there. But you know, once Cobo elected, they're you know, really the public housing um, component of this project is really drops. There's a um, kind of significant run in with the housing commissioner at the time who wanted to build them the maximum of public housing under the 1954 um, or 1949 Federal Housing Act and Cobo wants to build the minimum and the housing commissioner resigns. Um, yeah, so, you know, federal policy, of course, is huge in this 1949 Federal Housing Act, um, provides a lot of money for quote unquote slum clearance. Um, 1954, there's more funding for um, public housing too that, you know, again, Detroit does not tap into as much as it can. Um, 1950, relocation demolition began. 1956, the Federal Aid Highway Act um, provides the funding that eventually covers uh, much of the cost of constructing Act 375, 1964. This highway is complete and open to the public. Um, Miles, can you move it to the next slide, please? One thing I'd like to add is I think that the demolition of Black Bottom for I-375 is doubly significant. Um, firstly, significant because of the sheer number of people that were displaced by this project and then adjacent slum clearance, slum clearance projects, um, but also ways in which this infrastructure project kind of accelerates um, white flight and really enables white flight by bringing the city center in contact with the suburbs. Um, and so it's not just a tool that displaces people, but it's a tool that actively furthers um, the spatial pulling apart of black and white neighborhoods in white flight. Yeah, thanks for that, Miles. Um, yeah, so just, you know, an organization in this kind of big historical overview session of the, I think, like 44 page um, report that we put together. The first sessions on housing discrimination and creation of the quote unquote slum. Um, yeah, and that's kind of a narrative intervention that we're trying to make that, um, you know, the word slum kind of, um, you know, maybe precedes culture of poverty um, writing, but has the, that same sort of I guess blame on people for their own um, circumstances and what a lot of you know the research shows um, you know for people like Tom Segru is that housing discrimination is is huge in this um, restrictive covenants not just you know the ones that say um, you know only white people can live here but things like lot sizes especially after Shelley B Kramer um, makes those covenants unforceable the things like lot sizes multifamily dwellings they're restricted those um, are you know really do um, you know, force um, people to live in the Lower East Side in kind of the city's oldest housing where, um, you know, there's huge disinvestment from landlords, especially as there's a housing shortage in these post-war -year years that, you know, they really can say, you know, we won't take people with children that will, you know, just overcharge, we won't make repairs, things like that. And there's, you know, at this time, very little that um, renters can do about it. Second big section, slum clearance and Detroit's abandonment of public housing, trying to get it again, those things of, you know, what does, um, yeah, what, you know, maybe was the possibility of significant, you know, investment in, you know, from these federal monies that were available in the, um, you know, real housing opportunities for Black people in Detroit. And um, displacement in its aftermath. So kind of where do people go after um, displacement? Obviously, there were huge barriers to home ownership, discriminatory lending, covenants, as you previously mentioned. And there's some um, there's some data from the city that I think I'll get to later. And yes, as um, Miles was talking about highway construction and suburbanization. So um, at this point, there already is sort of some start of white flight. And that's um, kind of you know, in the 1946 Detroit plan, the city talks about that as a reason to build these highways. And um, of course, you know, the, the effect on you know, property values. And I think even at this point, um, or, you know, a little later, um, really the private market is shifting um, significantly toward the suburbs, the Detroit Urban League um, did a report where he said between 1950 and 1956, there are around 178,000 new homes built outside Detroit, only 30,000 um, private units built within the city. And um, among these 178,000 units outside the city, they estimate only 750 have been available to non-whites. And um, even within the city, among these 30,000 private units, the you know 3,176 new public housing units, they said were basically um, all that were available to, to black people in the city. Um, Kevin, next slide, please, Miles. I think it, I think it's really key that the um, that the creation of of the highway allows for the movement of not just the people but of wealth outside of Detroit. That if you look at Detroit 1910 or 1920 in the pre-auto age, 
Um, most of Detroit workers or people in downtown businesses work and live in Detroit and that kind of tax revenue cycles back into the city. But I think what's really key about what the highway does and what redlining do is that they start to pull apart that wealth where you can work in the city, live in the suburbs, and that kind of pulls that wealth to suburban property tax revenues, uh, majority white neighborhoods, and that kind of promise of the egalitarian metropolis is um, foreclosed on through these kinds of um, highway projects. Yeah, thanks. That's that's well put. And yeah, just to over the key points, kind of talk about this, that the temporality of loss, you know, as Miles was saying, it's not just this one displacement. Um, you know, a lot of people coming into Detroit are part of this, you know, great migration, um, fleeing racism in the post-reconstruction South, um, looking for better economic um, opportunities in Detroit. Um, housing discrimination is something they face immediately. And um, the failure of public housing is something that, um, you know, a lot of people who are displaced, you know, they, they do get preference for public housing units, but um, that, you know, there are things like, you know, the city, of course, segregates um, white and black public housing units and for a very long time. And even after, um, I think the courts tell them that they have to integrate, they, they're very slow to do so. So there are um, excessive wait times for black families compared to white families on, on these um, wait lists. Um, forget the exact numbers, but they're they are huge. Um, yeah, and that you know this is a missed opportunity for investing in black communities' well-being. As I think I'll, I'll get to later, some there is suggestion that there is some support among black people um, in Detroit that there's an idea that these neighborhoods are not good housing and that they do want investment in creating something better, but that of course doesn't really come given you know the disinvestment in public housing. And uh, yeah, face black bottom paradise value or length of those of other black neighborhoods. Again, just you know, limited supply of housing that is available to black people in this time. Um, and the last is that highway facilitated the continued growth of the suburban home market. And um, yeah, we have a little kind of small case study of some neighborhoods on the kind of I three seventy five I seventy five corridor later. That um, get to that. Okay, the next slide, please. Yeah, so this is um what I had just previously mentioned. And um, yeah, so Madison Heights Rail Oak are on that kind of corridor. And um, between 1960 and 1970 census, the growth of these home values really outpaced those in Detroit proper. Um, if you take that to today, the gap is is far greater. And you know, if we're talking about um, the widening of the racial wealth gap, um, home ownership is, I forget the number, I think it's maybe a a third to a half of um, a family's wealth. It's in our report um, and I probably should have pulled it out, but did not. Um, but yeah, as you can see, it's just, as I was just mentioning, the, the gap widens in um, in uh, home ownership and in home values, which of course are an opportunity for, for building wealth that is foreclosed to um, black people who are not afforded the opportunity to you know, get things like federally insured loans to, to buy a house in these places if you know they don't already have restrictive covenants. Uh, next slide, please. I'd also like to just pull out on the right is the redlining map. Um, and it's really interesting to kind of look at the interactive redlining maps online to see that the area of Black Bottom just beneath the T in Detroit um, was explicitly signaled out as the redlined area because of its high Black population. Um, and that the majority of green-lined and blue-lined areas in Detroit, but also nationwide because Detroit's story is a national story, the majority of the Green Line neighborhoods were outside of the Detroit city limits. And that sets up in the 1930s, the pulling apart of um, two different trajectories for city and suburb. Yeah, thanks, Miles. And kind of that widening, tra those trajectories, you know, I, I just pulled up the 2020 census numbers. The median home value was $137,700 in Madison Heights and $236,600 in Royal Oak by 2020. And that's far greater than the $52,700 um, even home value in Detroit. Um, yeah, so this um, is a letter from William Price, who is the uh, community organization secretary of the Detroit Urban League to the incoming mayor, Albert Cobo in uh, 1949. And um, you know, here, yeah, I was, you know, I was at the Bentley, I was really struck by kind of the language here. Um, you know, Price says that, quote, this, this is a blighted area maintained almost totally by absentee landlords is, substantiated also by facts secured from Detroit Housing Commission. That's not the line. It's that, um, yeah, I. so he calls this um, a shameful blot on our community. 
And, um, you know, obviously the Urban League is not representative of everyone's um, perspective in Detroit, but in, in um, Black communities in Detroit. But there is some suggestion that, um, you know, there some people at least think that this is, um, you know, not a place where people should be living and that there is, you know, some hope that with federal investment or in public investment in, you know, public housing, constructing, you know, real better housing options that, um, you know, maybe clearing these neighborhoods is, is, is not a thing that, you know, someone like William Price is opposed to. Um, and yeah, I just, that's maybe one of the things that kind of, I guess, propels us in this um, conversation of like, what would maybe real investment have looked like um, in these, these neighborhoods. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this just was um, a snapshot of the Detroit plan. Um, in the interest of time, maybe I'll just go over to the next thing. Um, so I'll let my, my teammates speak. Um, yeah, this just kind of um, for, you know, the part on displacement and its aftermath just sort of shows how few housing options there really were for people at this time. Um, the, you know, rents in um, Black Bottom Paradise Valley were the lowest by far in the city. The median rent was 2682 um, in you know, the early 40s, and 95% um, of households are paying less than $50 a month. And as you can see here, the Detroit Housing Commission itself did this survey, which really showed that there were very few options for um, these families that did not qualify for public housing. And again, you can see here there are um, things like landlords saying that they won't take children. Um, yeah, there are places that don't seem, you know, well maintained and um, just kind of goes to show what um, what people were facing as they were displaced to try to find a new place. Next slide, please. I think what's also key is that it's an old and current, current event story too, is that homeowners build up home equity and the possibility of using the home as a tool of intergenerational wealth, whereas renters do not. Um, and so if you look at the differential rates of home ownership in Detroit, that translates into an emerging racial wealth gap. Um, so I think it's really interesting to look at Black Bottom, look at how many, how almost everyone there is a renter, almost everyone there is paying pretty high rents relative to the quality of the housing. And furthermore, that restrictive covenants and redlining of green lining of adjacent neighborhoods effectively lock them out, out of moving from this neighborhood to other areas. Um, and so this is kind of growth where you see the possibility of intergenerational wealth being forestalled, uh, being closed down when you look at just how many renters there are in ways in which federal policy provides tax benefits, provides economic and financial benefits to homeowners that are not afforded to renters. Yeah, so this is um, just what the Detroit Housing Commission um, reported in 1955 on where people went. Um, for the 11.5 percent of displaced gray sheet families had purchased homes. That is, you know, a very low number. Um, and yeah, 33.6 percent moved to public housing. Again, people who wanted to move to public housing did get preference on those wait lists. Um, 5.8 percent found "quote unquote" standard rental housing. Again, shows the difficulties of the private market. But you know, 49 percent they did not have um, numbers for, which is, you know, a, a, a huge gap. And um, for like, trying to figure out where people went, that's, you know, that, that's half of people who are displaced. And um, yeah, I guess maybe speaks to some of the challenges we had with, um, in this short time span, trying to, you know, identify um, you know, key information for, for this project. But um, yeah, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, I think, Miles. I mean, I'd like to identify the, that idea in the, um, I believe it, the Fifth Amendment of the Bill of Rights of no takings without just compensation. I think about the idea that the majority of people from Black Bottom were, I believe, displaced on without compensation on 30 days notice. Um, that comes to several thousand people, not just in Detroit, but nationwide, um, because I think that the Federal 49 Housing Act and 56 Federal Aid Highway Act, these are both global and local events. You know, they're national events, construction of a national highway system, urban renewal projects in every city. Um, but also really local length. And so this is kind of a key, kind of a, an entry point, I think, to look at Black Bottom as a way to understand larger national currents. So here are just uh, two photos of uh, Black Bottom, the area of Black Bottom past and present. Um, what we did is on the upper photo, we overlaid the buildings and the maps of the lost community. And on the bottom photo, the contemporary geography. 
Um, I think it's really key to look at how the dem demolition of the community represents a change of scale, a change of land ownership. If you look at the old maps, you see all these hundreds of parcels of hundreds or thousands of buildings. Look at the contemporary geography, larger structures that change in urban scale. Um, I think it's interesting to look at these old maps that see just how many small structures there are and ways in which that small and granular urban fabric um, represents to me a distributed home ownership, distributed property ownership, rental ownership, whereas that concentration of you know five or six buildings in a city block, that's five or six owners, in many cases, big owners. Um, and then at the main image on the right shows that area past and present. The key street kind of cutting through the middle of Black Bottom was called Hastings Street, about three miles from the Detroit River, all the way up into um, Midtown and, and beyond. And so you see on top and bottom that area past and present. And as you'll see from one of the following maps, there's a lot of um, black owned businesses, black owned theaters, hotels, all beneath the path of that highway that you see below. And this is another map that shows the location of the highway relative to um, the percentage of black people per census tract. Uh, there's two little splotches outside of it on the upper right hand corner that's um, by the Royal Oak Township. But the main area is to really key to look at how Hastings Street, uh, the core kind of the Broadway or the main street of the black community in Detroit goes right parallel, right underneath the path of the highway. And the highway really slices through that community. Um, so there's not just the removal of people for the highway itself, but also the, the physical fracturing of the community down its center line um, and the ways in which you're pulling apart um, urban spaces and the idea of not just connectivity, but um, even sometimes even the ability to walk to work. Um, and one thing I'd like to show you all is this little infographic uh, right here, if you can see it all. Uh, this is a little table that shows um, the displaced businesses by type. So across 42 types of businesses, there were at least 756 businesses total in the area cleared for the I-375 highway. Um, obviously, there's also you know, I-375 kind of merges onto I-75, as well as you know, Fisher Freeway, dozens of other freeways in Detroit and other cities. And so this is just the 756 businesses total from the area of the project that will be of I-375 that will be demolished and rebuilt as a boulevard, but not any of the other highways in Detroit. And so you can kind of multiply this number here as a fraction of a fraction of that total. Um, I'd like to pull out the, just the range of businesses particularly at the bottom, things like uh, furniture, things like furniture stores, um, grocery stores, billiards, parlors, and just the sheer numbers of those um, projects, as well as things like certain kinds of luxury businesses, um, like car maintenance shops or a tailor or performing arts businesses. And so I think this begins a kind of question that rhetoric of slum clearance to think about, you know, just how many businesses are there or types and ranges and diversities. Um, Another thing I'll pull out is um, just 240 businesses from Hastings Street alone, and that's the fraction of a fraction. All of these cleared for the highway, or if not cleared for the highway, closed because the highway kind of slices through the community and cuts off businesses from their prospective clients of Black customers on either side of that highway project. Um, I'd also like to pull out the kinds of the civil society kinds of organizations that were in Black Bottom. Um, a significant number of hotels, uh, particularly if you look at the 1940s and 50s green books, um, almost all of the hotels that were listed in the billiards parlors and the kind of black entertainment businesses listed in the black um, in the green book correspond to areas that are now either beneath Ford Field or beneath the path of I-375 and the um, I-75 highway. About 80 to 90 percent of those addresses from the green book are now beneath the highway. Um, and then the last one I'd like to pull out is that you have um, listed, and, and these are numbers pulled from the city directory, and the city directory lists the, the, the primary breadwinner or the householder of, the, of each, the main person of each family. And so just listed within the 20 block area of cleared for I-375 in the 1950s and 60s, um, the city directory lists about 2,174 um, households. And that's not, that's not people, that's households. And so you can multiply that by however many people are in each household. And you pair that number of the 2,200 households to the number of people living per room, per family, say five or six people, particularly in Black Bottom, which was the highest density neighborhood in Detroit. And so you're clearing 20 blocks from the most highest density neighborhood in Detroit. 
and that easily comes to over 10,000 people for just this small block area. And then you can multiply that for the length of the uh, section of I-75 within Detroit. And then the last statistic I'll pull out is the list of homeowners that among the 2,200 households, only 36 homes were listed as owner occupied. And that's in the entirety of the area cleared for the highway. And so homeowners will have been compensated, although compensated at underappreciated rates because of the legacy of redlining and the devaluation of Black Bottom. Um, but none of the other uh, renters would have been afforded. Or if they were compensated, um, they would have had, as Danny identified, real difficulties um, finding homes elsewhere in the city and therefore kind of really needing to crowd out to neighboring areas. I saw a statistic that somewhere around um, two thirds of the people displaced from uh, Black Bottom relocated to within five to 10 blocks of their former home, meaning that they're crowding from one neighborhood into adjacent neighborhoods and spreading that kind of very high density um, neighborhood that's not, I think, um, either economically or uh, sustainable in terms of health outcomes. And so that's one, uh, two of the deliverables that we created uh, last last semester. Okay, we are kind of out of time, but I'll zoom through my sections. Um, next slide. So I had the task of doing the narratives. And so this is kind of where we got to some of the tangible um, uh, recommendations for reparations. So I talked with Lauren, it was amazing. She gave us some definition frameworks to work with. So thinking of reparations as a way of thinking, also as something that exists for a long time. She talked about a relationship with citizens and the government. So that was important. And then also thought about the potential of Detroiters themselves to be coming up with uh, innovations and solutions for the future. So this kind of, again, longevity and relationship. Um, the next slide. Um, I spoke with um, Marsha Battlefieldpot, Marsha Music, who uh, was skeptical in certain ways and, and offered a lot of framings for um, the conundrum of uh, numeration, which we already mentioned. So kind of like, how do you monetize the, you know, how do you uh, enumerate the, the amount of loss, um, but then also specifically talked about a, a Black entrepreneurship at the site and just was looking uh, to have some kind of a Black presence after the fact. And next slide. Um, and finally, I sat down and chat with um, Bert Deering, who was very interested in Black ownership, talked a lot about agency and ownership that as something that was lost. And so that was something that he was suggesting for something uh, at the boulevard, as well as keeping the input and the feedback of the community members in real time throughout. And so the next slide, kind of in a bullet point form, a lot of um, suggestions came from just three people. And so that means a lot, you know, that there's like no shortage of ideas and possibilities for that space coming from Detroiters themselves, of course, with support and feedback from others. But there was Black home and property ownership, practical skill development, uh, generational wealth was a big idea. Re-education as far as history and the you know black contributions to American society. So thinking of like um, museums that could pop up down there, you know that kind of a thing. Mentorship, uh, black psychological rewiring. This I, I'll talk on a little bit more about on the next slide. But kind of like unlearning the shame that Miles was mentioning before and the blame for the conundrum conundrum that has happened right in this in this uh, space. Um, that is some work that was named family restoration, spirituality and fellowship, and then repair. So there are these like bigger um, tasks, right, that also have to do with reparations um, that the boulevard can speak to or not. And so that just is something to name. And on the next slide, there were some bigger considerations that I just wanted to mention really quickly. We know that the MDOT program as designed is not a reparations project. And so that just was important to like think about was like, that's the, the confines that we're working with. It's not in itself a reparations, reparations project, but what we're trying to do is um, think about the, what the potential that it has for it to be, right? And so that's just to name. Uh, from the interviews there also, yeah, just was the idea that reparations is complicated. It's not like we were not trying to, you know, no one is speaking on behalf of, right, the black community or any community, like there's there's complexity in the discourse um, then and now. Skepticism is the result of unsuccessful urban renewal programs that have happened. So just like, these are all, again, just contextual things to keep in mind going forward. Um, a black 
community involvement throughout and benefit was important. Guarantee of non-recurrence, this came out of the interview with Lauren. So making sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. So that's the point of actually having a kind of sensitive um, MDOT project so that this is not another you know, reiteration of previous harms. Accountability systems codified and enforced by institutions was a request. And then having a black presence, I said that already. So moving on, just to repeat the discursive themes that we um, have come out of our writing. So we're combating the, the slum language. Um, that's just, yeah, by documenting and remembering the vibrancy and the, the, the life uh, of the area, and then also documenting the neglect, right, that caused these issues. Um, looking at the issue of highways more largely, this is happening in other sites. So this hopefully could be portable and in conversation with other spaces. Then, we're talking about the role of the government in urban development. So kind of like, you know, where does policy intersect with equity? Like what is a reparative policy? That's an undertone of our paper. And finally, um, community involvement and benefit, which I said already, that's the North Star, making sure that this um, doesn't repeat or exacerbate, exacerbate historic harms. Um, just to close, we already talked about our research outcomes. I did a little bit, but we have the, Inventory and the data visualization. Our final project was 44 pages. That's a report. Um, Rita, thank you, sent over a three page summary. We also have the recorded and transcribed interviews working on those, but the, the you know, the videos and or audio are in our drive. And then the future projects are these projects that will launch um, after this kind of meeting and beyond. And then the next slide talks about kind of future research directions. And so these are all the um, I guess, archives that were sort of untapped or less pursued. And so Burton has tons. It was closed. So we were working with limited um, varieties, Black Bottom archives. We didn't get into as much. The Arts of Citizen Oral History projects at UM were um, being transcribed and digitized in a kind of slow process, but those are very rich and available some letters there. And then finally, I got the names of tons of other people in the space of Detroit who could be talked to um, and who could kind of speak to different angles of this um, project. So sorry to zoom past that last part so fast, but for the sake of time. And that's a bit, I think that's it.